Hello, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Travel. I'm your host, Chris Christensen come from AmateurTraveler.com. Joining me today is Jen Leo, who is back from gallivanting around the world for about a month. Jen, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Chris. I'm the other guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're, we're off our game. Hey, and Gary has just joined us. His laptop apparently connected. No, my laptop is not connected. I'm on oh, so Gary is coming coming to us on his phone. Okay, that worked. Uh, oh, we have the gang back together again. We've yeah. all been off traveling, so it has been a little difficult to, to try and do this, and we apologize for how long it has been between shows. Uh, Gary, did you want to say anything? Welcome. Uh, I'll see how this works. Last time I did this, I was in a mine in Poland, if you remember how that went. <laughs> yeah, well, well we, we almost recording. had the same thing here, where I forgot to press the record button here for a second. And then joining us as a guest today, coming to us from Africa, in the midst of a project called The Unseen Africa, which we will hear more about, is Francis Tapon, and who may lose power at any moment, because he's in Africa. So we're, we're coming to you by the skin of our teeth today. Francis, welcome to the show, or welcome back. Well, it's, it's ironic that Gary is the guy who's, what, and you're in the Bahamas, Gary? Where are you? I'm in Bermuda, and I've had no problem Bermuda. with my internet connection up until like an hour ago, and then it just started freaking out. I don't know what the deal is. So it's ironic that you're in Bermuda and I'm in Niger, and yet you're having more problems than I am. I think this is something, uh, limit, I think it's the router that I'm using. I don't think it's a general internet thing. I love it when Gary's in the islands because he's always happier. <laughs> well, speaking of freaking out, let's start with a story here that's coming to us from Chicago. There were people, tourists on the Willis Tower observation deck platform, and I don't know if you've ever been there. Gary, Francis, Jen, have you ever been to this where this they have this small ledge that it sticks out, out near the top of the Willis Tower that you can stand on and look straight down on the street level? And there were tourists who, as they stood up, that entire panel cracked all the way across. And they thought, oh my god, we're going to die. Uh, apparently, it was just the level that protects the main structural piece of glass from getting scratched that cracked that they replace all the time. But it was, I imagine, a very frightening situation. So first of all, anybody ever been there besides me? I have not, Chris. No. I prefer the term Sears Tower, thank you very much. Sears Tower, well, yes. It used to be the Sears Tower, but it is now... I went to the tower. Hancock Building, a different tower. Do any of you do this when you have... You know, I know the Tokyo Tower has these large plates of glass that you can stand on and look straight down. The one in Auckland does. I think many of them do now. Big fan or not? I am not, because I have a small fear of falling, so I, it's hard to get me to the edge of, of anything. I do not Two have a small up. fear of falling. I have a large fear of falling. <laughs> I have to convince my brain. <laughs> I, that have, this I is want to do the safe. one in the Grand Canyon. Oh, the one in the Grand Canyon, yeah, the uh, in the Havasupai mm -hmm. Reservation. Have you done that, Gary? Uh, no, but this summer I'm going to be going to the new one that just opened outside of Banff. Uh, it's very really? similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I'll be doing that. And if you go to the CN Tower in Toronto, they've added a glass floor to the observation deck so you can walk across it in a similar fashion. It seems to be all the rage just to prove just how little fear of heights or how little common sense you have. I'm not sure which. <laughs> Speaking of common sense... Um, Interesting story from Monarch Airlines. Small airline, I don't know if all of you or any of you have flown Monarch. They took a poll among their passengers, found out that 90% were just tired of trying to figure out whether you can or can't recline, whether it's proper to do it or not, would just as soon getting rid of reclining seats, and so they are. All, air, all seats on Monarch flights going forward will not recline, and they're saying they're doing it because the passengers asked them to. Uh, where does where, say it one more time? Where does Monarch fly? Uh, Monarch is, they do a lot of flying into Las Vegas. I know, uh, so this is an airline you should know, Jen. I've but, never uh, even heard of them. They're one of the most profitable airlines. Really? They sell okay. a lot of package deals as along with their uh, flights. Okay. But yeah, they're, well, let's they're talk playing. about the let's talk about the gross flights, Chris. <laughs> 
well, for, before we get into the gross flights, <laughs> is this good news or is this bad news? This is good. I think seat reclining is evil, and people who <laughs> recline seats should be summarily executed after the flights. But that's just my opinion. <laughs> well, why not before the uh, flight? Because that way, you, <laughs> wouldn't that be better if to execute them before they could recline, or as they're reclining? That way, you can enjoy the flight without them. Why kill them after the flight? Because we haven't developed the Tom Cruise pre-crime abilities yet. But if we could, I'd be all for it. <laughs> For the pre-recline, I would have to say that I will often not recline, but on a longer flight, I will almost always recline. And part of it is I'm six foot three, and the people who built the seats did not have me in mind. They basically have me stoop over for the entire duration of the flight, and it is no way I can sit in an airline seat without back pain, basically. But apparently, that's what I'll get if I fly Monarch Airlines. Now, they tend to fly shorter haul flights anyway, I think. So, Jen, you really want to get into this story. <laughs> I'm going to let you lead it then. Oh, you are, are you? I am indeed. Right, let, me, let me bring it up. Um, a U.S. Airways flight en route from... Oh, no, no, that's not the one. Is that? Did you want flight attendants or did you want four-legged passengers? I was thinking four-legged passengers. Which one were you talking about? I, w I wanted the four-legged one. Yes. Um, all right, here we go. Found it. Uh, a cross-country flight uh, made an emergency landing because a dog was pooping in the aisles and passengers were getting sick. I've never heard of this before. Has anybody ever heard of a dog pooping in the aisle in flight? No. Me neither. So they landed in Kansas City. Um, the dog was the dog crapped three times in the aisle, and people were getting sick. And uh, the second time after the dog pooped, they ran out of paper towels, and they didn't have anything else. The pilot came on the radio and said, "Hey, we have a situation in the back. We're going to have to emergency land." While I am not an advocate of dog pooping, I think this is a bit extreme to derail an entire flight. Yeah, you have to wonder how many people missed connections, missed getting home, missed their cruise, missed whatever, because... <laughs> okay, but how many, bathroom, how many bathrooms are on, um, on a normal flight? One on each two. side? Two bathrooms? How could you three. possibly run out of paper towels after only two dog craps? I and think you said it was a larger dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, like Marmaduke is flying. I didn't even know you could have a large dog on a plane. I thought uh, you could only have a little lap dog. Yeah, that's what I, I was surprised about. I think you can have therapy dogs if they fit under your seat, but I don't see how a large dog would have fit. I will know more about this topic uh, later on this year or next year because we are, fingers crossed, getting a dog uh, sometime this fall. But I, if I were the dog owner, I would have been mortified if people were getting sick because my dog was pooping. Maybe it was diarrhea. I mean, because how... I just don't, I just don't quite understand. <laughs> Jen, I think you should just rant for another five minutes, continue this train of thought to its logical conclusion. What was the dog eating? And then Gary uh, Fair enough, Gary. All right, we can let this go. I... There, the only other story that I wanted to cover today is uh, Thompson, who is a travel agent, travel, travel agency in the UK. There's a story that's coming out of the UK where a woman called them up to say that she wanted a refund for a trip that she had booked because she had just gotten the rather sad news that her husband had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And she claims that what they responded with is, why don't you just take somebody else? Hard to believe. People are stunned with silence. Well, <laughs> with that being said, let's talk about Africa. Gary and Francis, you uh, both have been spending a lot of time in Africa. Gary, you just got back from, what, two, three months in Africa? Five. Five months in Africa? Yeah. And then, Francis, uh, 
is spending just, you've spent the first of three years in Africa. Is that where you are so far with your trip? Uh, first of four years, yeah. Uh, uh, four so years. about 15 months. The last, the last 15 months I've been in Africa. Tell us a little more about the project that you're working on, Francis. Uh, basically, I wa I've never been to Africa before. I was a total Africa virgin, and then I just wanted to see the entire continent, but do it in a relatively slow way, so basically one month per country. And so I'm uh, doing a month per country with 54 countries. That means four years. You're starting north to south. Uh, yeah, northwest corner starting in um, and then heading through West Africa, then Central Africa, Southern Africa, East Africa, and then finally finishing up in North Africa. Best country you've seen so far, love to go back and spend some more time, and then the country that you couldn't wait to get out of. Well, I've only been to 17 African countries yet, so I could only judge from those, and they're all in West Africa. But I would uh, countries I would love to go back to is Mauritania. Um, it's just a huge country. I'd also like to go back to Mali. I just like the desert. I like these Sahara type countries and so that's what I would I would gravitate toward. The country, I, there's really no country I disliked, although I guess I would have to say maybe Guinea-Bissau. Um, it just, you know, wasn't that interesting. But still, I mean, I like all travel. So I, 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 even even Guinea-Bissau as relatively uninteresting as it was, uh, I would still enjoy going back. How about the country you were most glad that you now have kidnapping insurance? <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not sure where the most likely I'll get kidnapped, but yeah, I just got kidnapping insurance. I don't know if I should broadcast that to everybody, but <laughs> but um, basically, uh, it, uh, Chad is my next country, and, and I'll be going to northern Chad right along the Libya, Libya border. And that's probably not so good. But then Central African Republic goes right after that. And so both of those countries back to back are probably good places to have kidnapping and ransom insurance. For now, much later on, it's a three year package I got. And so when I get to Somalia, that will probably have a good, another good place to have it. But anyway, Francis, it's, it's nice. I have a question. It's kind of peace of mind. Francis, I have a question. Yeah, I watched your Unseen Africa video, and um, there was so much there. To, that got me curious about things. Share the story about, since you were just talking about how you love the desert, share the story about where you were and how it came about that you made bread in the sand. <laughs> yeah, that's a great story. Um, I actually uh, talked a little bit about it also with on Chris's podcast, uh, oh. at The Amateur Traveler. But, uh, but basically, it's a, it's a great scene. What happened was I, was picked, I picked up a hitchhiker in the Western Sahara, and I was heading to a town called Biaranzane, which is a small little village, basically. And he told me, well, why don't you just camp with us, me and my boss? My boss is looking over 600 camels. And so that's what I did. I just hung out with him and his boss. And the next day, while we were overlooking these 600 camels, this huge herd, um, they decided to make some bread. And what they do is they kind of cook a little fire uh, with coals in the dirt itself, make the dirt and the sand really, really hot. And then they throw a flour, you know, like basically bread, uh, uh, bread flour, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then you throw it into the dirt, and it cooks for about 15, 20 minutes. And then you pull it out, you dust it off, you get the ashes off, you get the sand off, you get the dirt off, and you scrape it all off, and you start eating it. And it's really warm and toasty, and it tastes like a nice pita bread that came out of the oven. Oddly enough, since you and I talked about that, I've been in Jordan, and one of the things I did is I was in a an Echo Lodge, the Fainan Echo Lodge in the Dana Nature Preserve, and went off on a bike mountain bike ride to uh, archaeological dig, 10,000-year-old archaeological dig. Well, the, the dig isn't that old, but the village that they're uncovering is that old. And the person who I was with was a Bedouin. He had grown up with that lifestyle, and so he did the same thing. He was, you know, he was using basically just flour and water and salt, mixed it up. He actually had it in a plastic bag and then put it in the coals in the fire that he made. And so I have had that bread or that type of bread nowadays, which is funny because I hadn't heard about it when you and I were talking recently. 
<laughs> Gary, you also just went to how many African countries? A bunch. A bunch. Um, <laughs> I'd have to count, yeah. It's like a dozen, I think. Well, so you were spent a lot of time in South Africa and then doing a lot of the little countries around that area, but then the big thing you did, which we told people you were going to, was the G Adventures uh, cruise up the West African coast. So did you have a country that you really, really want to get back to and one that you were glad to get out of? Uh, you know, I wasn't there long enough to, to want to get out of it. Uh, there were a couple places like Angola and the Republic of Congo where because we were on a ship, we just, I think there's cool things in that country, but they're not necessarily on the coast mm -hmm. or they weren't necessarily in the port we were at. So I think I would love to go back to the Republic of Congo, but I've, I've heard people talk about some fantastic national parks, but they're really far inland and right. the same in Angola. Um, I enjoyed Sierra Leone. Uh, I, I had a great experience there. It's a, it's a rather it's, it's the poorest country I think I've probably ever been to. Maybe yeah. on a par with the Solomon Islands. I I don't know who'd be. Uh, they've been through a very nasty war uh, that ended you know in the 90s, uh, and you can still see evidence of it. Uh, but I felt every at least in Freetown, everybody was very friendly, uh, far friendlier than I, I ever imagined. Um, you know, you know, I really enjoyed it. Uh, the two places that I wasn't as impressed with, and again, I think this is, it may have been a completely different experience if I had done it a different way, was Benin. Uh, there was a, a village on stilts out in a lake, and that was one of the most hostile receptions I've ever gotten any place I've ever been. Uh, I think that, not that there's a lot of tourists that go to Benin, but they get tourists that come through and only a small number of people benefit from the tourism trade. And so I think a lot of people are rather turned off by it, and I can understand why. But so yeah, what West happened, Africa is this a very example, different... You don't think they were hostile because they were listeners of this show then? No. <laughs> um, but West Africa, I mean, you know, one, one of the biggest takeaways I got from Africa is that we have a tendency to describe Africa as a uh, monolithic thing. We talk about Africa... Uh, in reality, it's an amazingly diverse place. Even some of these countries have, you know, dozens of ethnic groups. And, you know, the difference between West Africa and Southern Africa is huge. And there are differences even, you know, between the countries and even in regions of the countries. And, you know, we're familiar with the differences, say, in Europe and in Asia. But I just don't think we're cognizant of the differences, especially between the various ethnic groups of Africa. So we have a tendency to just sort of, you know, maybe we'll make a distinction between sub-Saharan Africa and, and the North, but that's about it. In reality, there's a lot there that we're just ignorant of. You yeah, I would agree something. in that kind of... The, no, I was just going to say, I don't know if... Uh, one of the things I agree with in there on Gary is just that how we just have this whole monolithic image of of Africa, and I would also add that we tend to either idealize it and make it like this little Eden, which is has these wonderful safaris and that kind of stuff, and and pretty tribes and that kind of stuff. On the other hand, we we see it as hell, where you have all these problems and and wars and and pestilence and AIDS, etc. So as opposed to somewhere in between these two extreme images of Africa, where everyday life goes on. And you know, that's the that's another problem that we have with our image of Africa. And I hope that's one of the reasons I'm doing my series and, and doing my and is try to educate people on that as well. Francis, I have a question. Um, on your site, it said that you've picked up over a thousand African hitchhikers the first nine months of your travel. Uh, were all of those comfortable for you, or were any of them a little bit? Um, were you ever concerned about your safety? I never ever was concerned about my safety at any point uh, with all those hitchhikers. The only time I was uncomfortable was when they were practically sitting on my lap because I had 11 people in the car. <laughs> so there was some times where I, they really, I mean Africans, they, they, they know how to pack them in. And I've had a lot of people, I've had people on the roof, I've had people hanging off the side of the doors. Um, because there's, my car you can actually, there's little platforms where you can, you can kind of like hang on. So people have, 
they'll just jump on the car and hold on to it and 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 ride with me for a few kilometers. So, but no, uh, Jen, I've never had any trouble at all with anybody. Um, no theft. In fact, I have a lot of electronics. Usually, I try to put them in the back. But just you know, I'll have my camera just lying there. I mean, people could swipe things and I wouldn't see it if they were smart about it. And just no stolen anything from me. Um, so it's and certainly not harassed me in any way. And so it's been a great experience overall. You know, one thing I noticed in in West Africa, uh, not so much in in the Gambia and Senegal, which get tourism, but in in many of the other countries, uh, nobody was begging. Right. None at all. And you know, you see that in developed countries. You see it in the United States, but in West Africa, uh, for the most part, there were no people begging. For, I, I think it has to do with the fact that there's very little tourism, and because the whole region's poor, there's really nobody to beg from. Um, but that, you know, that's another thing. What he was saying, I think we have a, a tendency to think of a place as poor, or if there was a war, that there's a lot of crime. And that isn't necessarily the case. Uh, they, they don't always go hand in hand. That's a good point. Although I will say that in Muslim societies, and there are in West Africa some states, some countries that are heavily Muslim uh, societies, there, because Islam, I wouldn't say condones begging, but certainly doesn't discourage it, and you're in fact encouraged to give to beggars. Uh, so as a result, like for example here in Niger, uh, there's a lot of beggars that I see, and 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 because Islam encourages you to be generous to beggars, they kind of I wouldn't say thrive here. Of course, there's never a beggar that really thrives, but they do all right. So uh, it, I guess it depends also on the impact of it, uh, where you are in West Africa. Is Islam a big deal or not? And that might be another way of measuring whether or not there's a lot of beggars or there or not. You know, that could be because, like I said, in, in Gambia and the Senegal. Uh, I, th I believe uh, Islam is about 80% of the country. So maybe I was thinking of tourism. Maybe that's uh, another factor as well. Could be. Francis, yeah. tell us a little bit about your daily life um, in terms of what you're eating, how you shop for food, where you're finding your internet, and how often. Yeah, so basically what I'm eating, I'm eating, of course, what everything local, all the locals eat. I mean, uh, so they have a fair amount of rice. They uh, they also eat with their hands constantly. Or when you're with somebody's house, it's always a big, uh, it's always one big plate. Uh, so it's a huge, like a casserole, if you will, and everybody just digs in with their hands. And so maybe five, six people surround this plate, and you all kind of dig into it. Sometimes, of course, you can have just your own separate plate. Uh, that just depends. Um, so it's a very social way of, of, of eating. It's, it's, it's a very fun way. Um, the food here tends to be pretty, uh, have a fair amount of spice. So if you like Thai food or Indian food, that kind of, uh, you know, kind of spiciness to it, they have it. And it was only in Liberia we found super spiciness. And as far as internet's concerned, um, it's, you can find it in all the major cities. Um, however, internet bandwidth is horrible. If my voice sounds very choppy to you, it's because our bandwidth is horrible. Uh, I have two questions for you right now. Say again, uh, Chris, I didn't I hear what that. Night, what time of night is it for you right now? Uh, right now it's midnight, and so the bandwidth is actually pretty good here in Niger because, of course, less fewer people are using the internet. Right, so right. if you were to have this conversation with me at noon, the bandwidth would be terrible. You said you had two questions, Gary? Yeah, first is, uh, what are you doing about visas? And especially, how did you get a visa for Guinea-Bissau? Because that is notoriously one of the hardest countries in the world to get into. Ah, that's a good question. I don't remember how I got my visa for Guinea-Bissau, but I definitely don't remember it being difficult. I I, I think, no, I, I know where I got my visa for Guinea-Bissau. I got it when I was in Senegal. And uh, it was just because it's a neighboring country, therefore it was relatively easy, I suppose, for me to get. But I don't remember having any trouble whatsoever getting it when I was in Dakar, which is the capital of, of Senegal. Yeah. Um, so that, was, that just... wasn't a problem. I think the biggest you... problem I had so far was getting a visa for uh, Ghana. Ghana, they, they require you to get your visa from your home country. And so when you're traveling overland for months or years in Africa, it's obviously very inconvenient to do that. 
And I hear also that the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, also requires you to get it from your home country. I don't know if that's true. And for Niger, it took me two weeks to get the visa from the embassy that was in, um, where was I? I was in uh, Accra, I think, when I got my visa for Niger. Uh, it took two weeks, which was kind of unusually long. Usually it's 24 to 48 hours. And my other question, one of the, the common things I saw in every country was the presence of the Chinese building roads, building you know buildings. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the reason they're doing this is because of the mineral wealth in Africa. Uh, how much of that did you notice? I definitely noticed it for sure, but I also I, I'm wondering if maybe you and I, because we're Westerners or Americans, that we sometimes glaze over our own U.S. aid signs. Because if you stop and think and you look really, you'll start seeing USAID, USAID, USAID all over the place also. And so I would say that it's hard. I mean, this is totally anecdotal, but it feels to me like USAID and the EU, because I see a lot of, uh, you'll see a lot of signs that says this was financed by the EU or this was financed by USAID. And that if you compare those, I don't think that China is that much more into Africa at this point than Europe and the United States. I, I would like to hear your opinion on that like a year or two from now when you start to go through more of Central and Southern Africa, Zambia, Angola, Congo, places that have more mineral wealth. Uh, I think a lot of the Saharan countries are probably devoid of it. We didn't see a lot of it in like Gambia, Senegal, um, but it was very noticeable in certain countries and they're doing very large projects, the type of which that EU and, e and U.S. aid usually doesn't cover, um, but but I you know it, it's what they're doing I think is very strategic, and they're basically rather than colonizing Africa, they're just sort of buying it. Yeah, I do. Did you get a sense? Did you talk to the locals and get a sense of whether or not how they feel about Africans? I mean, sorry, about Chinese people and their Chinese presence. Do they have good feelings about them, or do they look at them negatively? Or neutral? Um, I think it depends. I think in Angola, a lot of the people, there, there was a lot of Chinese work being done in Angola, but I think a lot of the benefit to all that goes to the elites and it all gets shipped out of the country. I don't know if they're necessarily blaming the Chinese or if, if they're looked down upon. Um, the other thing I noticed is that there are also Chinese stores in many towns. And um, even in South Africa, I noticed every every community has what's called a Chinese store, which is basically just a discount store. So you can go and buy products yeah. made in China. It could be a motorbike, it could be a generator, television, sewing machine, whatever. Um, so you know, it's I, I think they understand what's happening, but there are also benefits. I saw those Chinese stores in Morocco and in very developed countries, let's say like Cape Verde, which islands right off the coast there of West Africa. So yeah. there's where I saw those Chinese stores and the Chinese, uh, the attitude toward Chinese I would say was in general I would say lukewarm. They're, they're, they're not extremely positive and, I'm, and they, they, it seems like in the West African mind at least that Americans are still number one as far as having good feelings about that and the, the Chinese are like number two and the French are dead last and I can say that with confidence because I'm actually half French, I have a French passport, my father's French and so and I speak fluent French and so a lot of times I would be talking to West Africans in French uh, and they would tell me right in my face how much they hate the French and I'd be like well I'm French and they're like well I don't hate you but your country sucks <laughs> and so there's incredible negative feelings against the French uh, throughout West Africa and they constantly have this perception that uh, Anglophone countries uh, so such as Niger Nigeria or Ghana uh, have much better development than the French the Francophone countries and they they have a tremendous resentment against it but the Chinese are kind of in the middle and they uh, they're not as admired and as loved as Americans but they're but they're not as hated as the French I, yeah, I definitely noticed, um, I, and I think it may have to do with the fact we've never had colonies in Africa. You know, the British did, the French did, the Portuguese did, even the Spanish did. Uh, we really haven't done much in that region. Uh, certain, you know, I mean, we're obviously involved in the slave trade, no doubt about that, but we weren't running um, uh, the slave trade in the continent. At the time, they were simply being shipped to the United States and other 
you know, American countries as well, such as Brazil and uh, places in the Caribbean. Maybe that has something yeah, to do with the also- legacy. That's part of it, and I think also, uh, like, even when the only country you, we could say that we were heavily involved with was Liberia, right. and even there in Liberia, we were kind of hands-offish. And th- second of all, though, it really helps to have Obama as the president. Uh, <laughs> really, he is a, he's a beacon. <laughs> they had Obama beer that we purchased in Republic of Congo, <laughs> and it tasted horrible. It was absolutely <laughs> horrible beer. <laughs> did it did it have his picture on the can? No, it just said Obama beer. Uh, and there were also several uh, small businesses that had the name Obama in them uh, that I saw in both South Africa and Ghana. So you're saying Obama yeah. beer promised more than it could deliver. <laughs> I didn't think it promised anything. It just said Obama. <laughs> but the thing is with uh, Obama, I mean, he, he really is... Uh, it's great impression to Africans, and, and it shows that America is kind of an open society too. Uh, but I think it's also interesting is that there's a lot of Muslims. Uh, there's countries that are 90% Muslim in in uh, in Africa. And for example, right now I'm in Niger, which is heavily heavily Islamic, and yet they adore America. They really like it, and they don't have any of the negative feelings that a lot of Arabic. Muslim countries have. So I think Americans sometimes clump all Muslims together and they think that all Muslims hate America. And that's just wrong. That we need to correct that and distinguish between uh, sub-Saharan Muslims and those who are kind of more Arabic or North African uh, Well, Muslims. even with that, I mean, I was just in Jordan and my tour guide was talking about a conversation he'd had with someone in Egypt after the Arab Spring who the Egypt person was basically thinking that, you know, it'll only take us six months to get our whole act together with this government thing, you know, how hard could democracy be? And my tour guide was relaying this conversation. I guess as part of this conversation, he had said to the other guy, well, what do you think is the best country in the world? And they both agreed very readily, well, it's it's the U.S. Mm -hmm. So even in that region, there is, at least among many or some, um, a an interesting, real positive view of the country that I don't know that we always live up to, but uh, it was interesting to hear that. I will say this, though. uh, The last two World Cups, Ghana has eliminated the United States, and they're looking to do it a third time. (laughs) We're in the same group as Ghana. Politics is one thing. Soccer is an entirely different thing. Football is, you know. Francis, explain (laughs) how you're getting this positive impression. Uh, what are they doing to show you or tell you? Give us a scenario. Well, they ask me where I'm from, and I'll usually just say I'm from America. And then their face just lights up like I just you know, had an orgasm. It was just incredible. Like, oh, my God, you're from America. That's so great. I love your country. Da, da, da. So that's the, the, the pretty standard thing that happens. And it's very genuine. I mean, you just you can't fake that so easily, I think. And so... Uh, that's that's the the typical thing, and then people say, oh, I really want to go there. Da da da. Now, I will say one thing uh, to Chris um, that I think also people around the world they distinguish between American politics and government and our intervention in in certain countries. Oh sure. Versus the country itself, and so I think they're mm-hmm. pretty good at saying, okay, well, you're, we hate your country's politics and its military and its interventions, but I sure want to live there. <laughs> I've, I've experienced the same thing all over the world uh, you know they'll criticize the government and then it's like oh yeah but I want my kids to go to school there uh, I especially <laughs> saw it in some parts of like the South Pacific I was, I remember I was in the Solomon Islands and uh, they couldn't distinguish between English accents that well so they always assumed I was Australian when I said no I'm American yeah, their face would light up, and, and they would still talk about the war. And I said, yeah, I had my, my great uncle served here. And uh, then they would tell me, you know, oh, you got to go visit this battlefield and this battlefield and blah, blah, blah. And uh, there were several places where I've had that. And I think, you know, a lot of Americans are afraid to travel because they think everybody hates them. It is just not the case. I've only had one really anti-American thing ever said to me, and that was in Iceland 14 years ago. 
I was doing a fair bit of solo travel in, during the Bush administration, and it was not fun to say that you were from America. There was all sorts of blowback and listening to rants in taxi cabs, and I remember this happening in London, it happening in Australia, and it was just annoying. I, I think I, I have agree to with say that I've heard general. a lot of anti-American sentiment, but I live near San Francisco, so that's really where that's coming from. So. <laughs> Communist land, uh, but uh, but I would agree with Jen that when I was traveling during the Bush era, I was actually in Eastern Europe, which is even like the one of the worst places to be uh, for that I time was there. period, just because. Okay, there you go. So it was the same experience for me for sure. But again, it goes back to what we're talking about: is just they're distinguishing between our policies and versus their desire to live here. I mean, if a lot of Africans who, when I introduce myself, they immediately want to know my phone number. They want my email. Give me a contact really? information. Because they absolutely because they just want to have a contact in America. So if ever they have a prayer of a chance to go there, and I'll get emails and I'll get people like, hey, we met at this place. Uh, I really want to go to you know blah blah blah. So they do love America for sure. And Africans, uh, but you know, here's one more thing I'll say about the West Africans. That they, in general, what impressed me, because after I'd spent the previous three years in Eastern Europe, and in Eastern Europe, almost everybody hates their neighbors, almost universally. The people in Hungary hate almost everybody. Everybody in Greece hates all the countries around them. They just all hate their neighboring countries. Uh, Estonians hate the Russians. I mean, it just goes on and on. And in Africa, I'll always ask about the neighboring countries. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we like them. What about, what about these guys? Well, we like them, too. What about Togo? They're good. How about Ghana? They're nice. Burkina Faso, that's cool too. <laughs> they have nothing against anybody. Really, it's hilarious. So that's why they just, they don't really have anything against any country, really, except France. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the, w when I was on my trip, we had several uh, academics who studied Africa. And one of the things they pointed out, with the exception of the recent split between Sudan and South Sudan, every border in Africa was created by Europeans. And a lot of those borders make absolute, all of them pretty much, make no sense in terms of the ethnic and linguistic um, you know, divisions between people. So a lot of times you'll find the exact same people you know, in terms of ethnic and tribal affiliations on either side of the border. So I don't think that, and when I ask people about this, they tend to say that they first and foremost will identify their tribe, and then second, their nation. So they'll say, I'm Mandinka from Senegal, I'm Mandinka from Mali, not I'm Senegalese and then Mandinka, if that makes sense. So that, and I don't yeah, think there's ever been many border wars in Africa. I was seeing the same thing in the Middle East where the big association with what tribe am I in? Yeah. My tribe does this way, we dress this way. Chris, uh, when... Again, you have the borders there drawn by Europeans. So, yeah, Jen. Chris, when you're in Jordan and you're mm -hmm. talking to a local and they ask where you're from, what do you say? Do you say you're from America or do you say you're from California or do you say you're from San Francisco? I usually say California in the United States. I say California. People know where California is. Mm -hmm. When I say I'm American, they say where from? New York, California? I go, right. no, Wisconsin. And they go, well, I don't know where that is. <laughs> You say so, Green Bay Packers? <laughs> and they go, oh, yeah, I don't Aaron Rodgers, number yeah. one. Now, Francis, when you and I, you know, when we did a recent interview uh, for Amateur Traveler, you were in what country at that time? Um, I think I might have been in either Niger or Benin. So that just reminds me of what is the country, and this is a question for both you and Gary, that you're going to have the hardest time convincing people that you're not making up when you get home? <laughs> Sao Tome um, and Principe. Uh, <laughs> Gary, Francis, which country? What? That, that well, I'm not making up? like the, you, you, know, you were telling me names of countries that, and I think I'm fairly good at geography. That Comoros. I Comoros. Comoros is, I mean, I haven't been there yet. But I had never heard of Comoros as being an African country in my entire life. Yep. Oh, and I'm so I had to, to look that, that one up. <laughs> yeah, Comoros, Seychelles, and Mauritius are all considered African. Well, I tell people I went to Sao Tome, they don't, they don't know where, they've never heard of it. 
They fall into the category of what I like to call opening ceremonies at the Olympic countries. <laughs> and not the Winter Olympics. No. <laughs> Excellent. Do we want to talk about anything else before we move on to tips? But how about a special round of tips here for things you should know before you go to Africa? Ooh, good one, Chris. Um, yeah, I'll say I'll say one. You're gonna find a lot of vendors selling souvenirs, and there's a good chance that a lot of the masks that they're selling are not local. So I saw some of the very same tribal masks in South Africa that I saw all the way up in like Senegal. And if it wasn't for the fact that we had an, an art historian and an expert on African mass with us, uh, you know, I, I learned quite a bit. But a lot of times they're not local. Uh, they're not manufactured where they are. So it, just be cognizant of that, uh, that they may have been manufactured somewhere else and it may not be indicative of the region you're visiting. They might be sold out of the China shop. <laughs> Chinese shop, Gary? Possibly. I mean, that, that's that's true. I mean, a lot of souvenirs are made there, but usually the the wooden ones are made in Africa, but they may not necessarily be uh, of a tribal group where in the area that you're visiting. Francis, best tip for Africa so far? Money buys you everything. Money buys you everything. So if you ever have, yeah. In other words, if you have any kind of uh, problem you can almost always negotiate it with money and so uh, don't think anything is impossible in Africa everything is possible uh, you can just massage it and and you might have to pay a little extra but pretty much anything is possible and that goes with visas that goes with anything that you need to do that if they ever tell you you cannot do that it's impossible or you can go there or whatever any anything is it can be easily uh, negotiated and if you're on a little bit of extra money, it's a done deal. Now, that is a very Africa, diplomatic way to put it. <laughs> yeah, Africa is the only place I think I've ever really had trouble with money when we were in Arusha in Tanzania. Periodically, like every other day or every day, the ATM machine would just run out. It's just like, oh, when we get money, let, we have to go early because if you go in the afternoon, there will be no money. I Have, have you yeah, seen that's happened to like me. that? Yeah, yeah, it definitely has happened uh, as well here in West Africa. Now, the good thing is that most, I would say about half, if not more than half, of West African countries have used what's called the CEFA, which is a Central African currency. So mm -hmm. so it's a common currency like the, like the euro, and so if you ever run into an ATM, you just take boatloads of money out as, as much as possible. This did screw me up when I was in Sierra Leone because I came in from Guinea, which, uh, which did not use... Uh, the same currency, but I basically I ran into only two ATMs in Sierra Leone, and one of them did not accept my card, or none of my cards, and uh, the second one didn't work. And so by the time I was actually leaving Sierra Leone, I had no money. I was picking up one hitchhiker who I borrowed a few bucks from, and I got to the border, and they were asking me for all these fees, and I just kept on saying, I have no money, and I spent hours at the border saying, I have no money for all your silly fees. And because I because none of the ATMs work, so yes, your advice is right, Chris. When you see an ATM and it works, take a boatload of money. Oh, by on, on a similar note, we, I found that uh, dollars will often work in a lot of places. Um, yep. That you can either convert them or, uh, at least in the big cities, um, you can buy stuff with dollars. Euros as well. <laughs> Depends. I think the French-speaking uh, places were more apt to accept euros. Was the credit card yeah, system I mean, chip and pin? I think it's largely non-existent. There's not a lot of places you can pay with credit card, in my experience. So that's good to know too. Yeah, yeah. Credit cards are basically don't exist in anywhere except Morocco that I've seen so far. Gary, have you seen any other places? Maybe South Africa. Yeah, South Africa. You can use it any. Uh, you know, there's there's several um, in southern Africa. It's South Africa, Lesotho, Swaziland, Botswana, and Namibia. Those five countries are pretty much reasonably developed. You can rent a car in South Africa, drive to any of those without any issue. Uh, you shouldn't have a problem in, in most of these places finding ATM machines and, and credit cards. Uh, but once you get out of that zone, it becomes a real 
it becomes a challenge. Yeah, it's definitely a cash-only society. And in fact, even running into banks sometimes, unless you're in a major city, uh, it's sometimes hard. So, but I, Gary's right. The dollar is 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 the default uh, currency uh, of choice over the euro. I would say. And in Liberia, a little bonus, you can go to ATM machines because it was an ex-U.S. affiliate. Uh, you can get U.S. dollars out of a, an ATM machine, and you can pay for anything in Liberia with U.S. dollars. Any anything mm. is is, uh, is 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 payable to U.S. dollars, and they'll give you change sometimes in Liberia. And it's very confusing because they will always tell you things. If it's a cheap thing, let's say you're just buying some a little bag of nuts. They'll say, I'll ask how much is that, and they'll say fifty dollars, and you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's because they're talking about Liberian dollars, because one Liberian dollar is worth roughly, sorry, one U.S. dollar is worth seventy-five Liberian dollars or so. So any little thing that costs less than a couple of bucks, they'll quote you in Liberian prices, and so all of a sudden you get this kind of strange sticker shock, and then you realize, okay, well they're just talking Liberian dollars. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's the uh, that's the one place that uses U.S. dollar in Africa that I know of. Uh, oddly enough, ironically, as we were talking about how everybody wants to live in the U.S., I don't know if you heard a doorbell ring on my end, but that was a South Korean a, a foreign student who's come to live with us for a few weeks while she studies her English. So, we're just all right, so let's wrap this up then. Um, one last question, or actually two. One is uh, malaria and prophylactics. What do you do if you're there for four years? I know they don't recommend some of the things that you normally would take if you're there for two weeks for an extended trip. I got malaria already in Ghana, and oh, okay. so I, what I was doing, my, my strategy was simply to uh, use the uh, anti-malarial pills, uh, in this case chloroquine, which is not really that effective anyway, but that's all I could find in Senegal. Uh, I would use it just during the rainy season because that's the time when most people get mosquito bites during the mm -hmm. rainy season. But in December, which is not the rainy season, in I was in Accra and somehow I got malaria and it was uh, kind of a downer, but now that I have it, I'm pretty much, well, screw it. So I'm probably not going to take any more anti-malarial medicine, maybe when I get into some real jungly place area, I will I'll take it again. But I agree with you; it's not a good idea to take it nonstop. And a lot of Peace Corps volunteers uh, who work they have these two-year sessions, mm -hmm. sometimes three years. They also uh, ought to take it, but they don't take it all the time. So, um, one thing that is good about Africa is because almost everybody you meet has had malaria at least a few times. Uh, that 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 uh, they have plenty of medicines at every pharmacy. So you go to any pharmacy anywhere in Africa, even in villages, they will have anti-malarial medicine uh, there for you. So just buy it, travel with it, so that if you start feeling like you're getting the flu, you probably have malaria. Uh, if you can get checked out, check your blood out, then you'll find out if whether or not for sure you have it. But if if you have any, if you don't have that ability to check then just take the anti-malaria medicine. And for me, it was actually fairly benign. It only lasted about two days. of, And I just felt like having the flu. It wasn't that bad. I've heard some horror stories, but for me, it was pretty benign. Well, of course, the problem is you don't get over it either. That's right. It, yeah. it can it's come back. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's skip my other question. Let's go on to our regular tips. Uh, who brought a tip for us this week? I'll start. Uh, just to let everybody know, in case you've been hiding under a rock, that TBEX North America was finally announced, and mm. it is headed to Cancun, Mexico, September 11th to the 14th. Woohoo! Are you going, Jen? I am. I'm excited. Actually, the uh, the three of Gary and Jen and I will also be at the DMAI conference conference in Las Vegas in July. July 21st. Um, so if there is a possibility we might do some sort of meetup while we're in Las Vegas. We haven't really talked about it yet because we haven't seen each other in, well, in since you month. have seen us. Yeah, let's <laughs> so. definitely do a live show in Vegas, baby. <laughs> so uh, it, was that your tip, Jen? Uh, yes, but if you're going to complain about it, I also I have an app tip. 
Um, for those of you who use GoGoBot, they did a complete app overhaul. So if you haven't checked in it, haven't checked into your GoGoBot app lately, check it out. It's a completely new look. They've overhauled it. Um, it looks and works great. And uh, some of the new features are that now you can sync them um, across multiple devices. And you can also um, share your travel itinerary among multiple users. And for those who are new to GoGoBot, you do not need to sign in and have an account. Um, if you want to book a hotel, find restaurants, or just browse the app. Cool. Hey, I had a Can question, you? Jen, about that GoGoBot app. Hold on. I just want to ask her about it. Mm -hmm. My problem with a lot of these travel apps, guys, is that they don't work or they're very disabled if they're not online. And when you're traveling, for example, like I am in Africa, where I don't have a data plan and I don't have Wi-Fi almost ever, so it's, these apps pretty much don't do anything. Does the GoGoBot app, or do you know, uh, does it does it have any functionality when you're offline? Uh, I don't have it right in front of me. Um, I'm sure that there's that some parts does. that are offline and yeah. other parts that aren't. Uh, if you are researching apps before your trip, always check and see which parts are offline and not. Some ones that are some that are content based, you have the ability to download the content mm -hmm. uh, before. And there's lots and lots of a lot of the map apps are offline now. Right these so, days, right? Yeah. yeah. In fact, I think the Google Maps app has just put in some offline map features. Uh, don't don't swear to that, but uh, I, that's either coming or just was announced, because that's a real big need. You know, same thing. You know, when I travel, I very rarely have a a data plan. Gary, did you bring a tip for us? I got a couple. Seeing I haven't been on the show for a while. Uh, tip you're number not, you're one. You do one per week that you've missed, have you? No. Uh, <laughs> tip number one: Don't be afraid to go to Africa. A lot of people are afraid. Uh, maybe it's not something place to go for your first trip, but you know there's a lot of great things there, and you know it can be challenging at times. But I don't think people should be afraid of it. Uh, it's a wonderful place to visit. Tip number two: it Turns out you can use your iPhone or Android device to do Google Hangouts, uh, which is what I'm doing right now. So go figure. Um, tip number three: uh, You can't see this if you're obviously Google listening Chrome. to us, but uh, this little device I held in my hand is a Google Chromecast, and it's a very cheap device. It cost me $35, and it has an HDMI port, so if you're in a hotel with a Wi-Fi connection, you can plug this into the television in the hotel room and play uh, anything, you know, if you're streaming Netflix or Hulu or YouTube or something else that's quasi-legal, uh, you can watch it on the big screen. And this is such a tiny, cheap device that uh, if you do a lot of traveling and you're going to be in hotel rooms and, and you want to use your uh, computer on a larger device, uh, give it a try. This will also work with uh, Android and iPhones as well. Uh, anything you stream to the phone can be put on the television set. Cool. Excellent. Francis, did you bring a tip for us? Uh, I haven't been on the show for a long time, so I've got 50 tips. But I'll just narrow it down to two. Um, uh, one, since we talked about maps and we were talking about Google Maps, it just brought me up uh, this idea. Of my favorite app, it's only, I think, a dollar. It's called Maps With Me. And uh, you can get it. There's a free version, a version, which you can you should try. But I think it's worth paying for the the, um, the paid version. But what I like about it, instead of Google Maps, first of all, it's all vector-based and incredibly fast. It works 100% offline. You basically it didn't take up a whole lot of space. So all these benefits. So basically, if you want the entire map of, I don't know, France or Chad or something like that, you just click on it, and it's just a relatively small file, maybe just a 10 to 50 megabytes, depending on the how complex the, the roadmaps are. And it will download, and then you'll have it offline, and then you can zoom in, and you can store features, you can search things, you can put little uh, bookmarks, uh, little pins there. It's just better than Google Maps uh, in many ways, I find, just because of the speed and offline abilities. I got really angry at Google Maps when they took off a lot of their uh, offline abilities or made them a lot less convenient. Again, I haven't checked it recently in the last month or so, so I don't know if, if, if the update is much better. But if you're frustrated with the inability of Google Maps, then check out Maps with me. Second tip, 
Um, for the, I'm running a Kickstarter campaign, and one of the sites that I go all the time to uh, is uh, KickTrack. So it's uh, Kick and then T R A Q, and it's a great site for people who like or run. Oh, I think I'm gonna lose my power here. Sorry. Did we just lose him? Uh, well, yes, I'll tell the URL that he was talking about one more time. Kick track, kick, and then T-R-A-Q. And um, Francis also has a project there uh, for the Unseen Africa on kicktrack.com. You know, it kind of reminds me of something uh, that someone told me when I was in Africa. Africa always wins. And I think that kind of just happened to Francis right now. <laughs> All right. Well, it's good seeing everybody. Thanks to our listeners for uh, being so patient and hanging in there with us. I think we should do this again next week, and we should I put the you. week back into this week in travel. I am available. I can't hear Chris. He's giving silent assent. I will. We will put a link to Francis's Kickstarter. Uh, on the show notes so that people can find that and support the Unseen Africa if you're interested. Gary, where can we find you on the internet? Uh, pretty much everywhere. Everything-everywhere.com and from there you can find pretty much anything you want. Anything new at Everything Everywhere? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, I, I just got done. I did a basically a daily sort of a diary update from the West Africa trip and I've completed all those and so I'm just editing my final photos from from Africa now um, after the West Africa trip I went on a photo safari I did my annual photo tour with G Adventures went to Kruger National Park took some fantastic photos and I got a thousand of those to plow through and uh, hopefully I'll be publishing some of those online soon well and oddly enough hasn't it been at least a month since you won an award or something uh, I, I don't know. I, it's hard to keep track of those things anymore. <laughs> and Jen, what's new at JenLeo.com or the burgeoning Jen Leo empire? Well, actually, I wanted to let you know that the LA Times got a overhaul on their website. So now you can actually find my columns, um, not just one at a time that week, but you can find my whole stream. So, Chris, maybe you can put that in the show notes. I just yep. sent it to you in our chat. So once you go into one uh, column for Web Buzz, in the lower, in the sort of on the side on the right, it will show you uh, all, it will give you a link to other Web Buzz columns, and you can click on that. And if you're behind on your travel website and travel app review reading, you can find uh, pages and pages and pages of previous columns there. Excellent. Uh, Amateur Traveler, the, I think our latest episode that should be up before, probably before this one comes up, is on Lassen National Park in Northern California. So just as close to San Francisco as Yosemite, a lot less tourists and one big volcano. Um, also doing more videos, so check out uh, AmateurTraveler.com for that. With that, Gary, we've missed you. Would you like to have the last word on this show? Until next time, get outside and get yourself to the continent of Africa.